Thank you. My name is Doug Levesque, and I am from the Bible Nation Society. For those of you that are here, we have some literature on the table. There's some free things on there, and there's some things uh, to peruse as well. It's a pleasure to be invited to the Constitution Party to act as moderator. I've had a lot of time uh, to work with Bill and to formulate good questions so that we can give these gentlemen uh, a great platform to share what they believe and uh, sh to show us their leadership today. So we've drawn straws and we have an order and they also have a timer and there'll be a positive tone that comes on when they are of time. Uh, if our third party uh, doesn't show up today, we'll have a little bit more time and so I'll be a little bit more um, open with uh, the agenda there. Uh, but they will uh, be allowed to have an opening statement. They can introduce themselves for several minutes. And uh, when they've done that, we'll begin questioning. They'll have 90 seconds to answer a question. And then they each have a, a fair amount of rebuttals to mm -hmm. utilize. And they'll have 30 seconds for the rebuttal. We have a lot of questions. We'd like to get through them all so they could speak to a, a large number um, of items. When we're done, we'll have a closing uh, comments. And then once the cameras are turned off, we'll come back and let them relax a little bit and answer your questions as well. And uh, feel free to applaud. And uh, this is not one of those other parties. And so uh, applaud. Uh, we're gonna, this is going to be informative, but it's also going to be a little bit of fun mm -hmm. as well. I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for your civic you. service, for your sense of duty, and for your preparation for the debate. We're all praying for you to do a great job today. All right, well, let's get started, and uh, we drew straws. First up is John Diamond from Pennsylvania, and so, John, give us your opening statements. Introduce yourself to us. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is John Diamond. Um, I'm the director of Peacemakers Outreach, which is a nonprofit uh, Christian educational organization back in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. I'll just go ahead and just, since we got two minutes, give you my background. Um, I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I remember sitting at the at the table with my father about probably eighth grade, and I remember he looking at me and said, he said, son, a lot of good men have died to give you the freedoms that you have here today. And, and that was probably the most important thing that he probably ever had said to me. Um, for that reason, I had joined the United States Air Force even before my senior year of high school. Uh, six days after I graduated, I entered the United States military, um, which I took an oath to support the, the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Um, I've come in my last 30 years to realize we have far more domestic enemies than we have foreign ones. Um, and many of them are in the Democratic and Republican Party and sitting in Washington, D.C., uh, especially the United States Supreme Court, who are just destroying and rewriting the Constitution. Um, I, I got out of the Air Force after eight years, uh, began, became a lineman for the electric company down in Columbus, Ohio, did that for about 20 years. I worked my way through Bible college. Uh, got my master's in theology and my doctorate in Christian education, uh, at which time I, I met a nice young lady. We got married. Um, I have four little boys under the age of seven. Uh, we quit quit the job, $100,000 a year job, to start this Christian <laughs> outreach and ministry um, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, and, and I think one of the main, the, the two main driving motivating factors in my life are A, my oath to God to support and defend the Constitution. And secondly, something Ronald Reagan said when he said that freedom is never more than one just generation away. He said, we don't want to sit in our twilight years and have to explain to our children we sat and did nothing. And I refuse to sit and look at those four little boys in the eyes and say, I did nothing. If it falls and America goes the wayside like every nation on the ash heap of history before us, it won't be because of me and it won't be because of my watch. So I will, I will proudly stand before them, and they know what I'm doing. Um, so that's, that's why I'm here. That's my sole motivation for, for what I'm doing. Um, I, have no, I have no great political ambitions. I'm kind of like Ronald Reagan. I'm just a guy that is tired of seeing the corrupt politician destroy this country. And if, if it ain't like people like me and you that raise up and take this country back, we're, we're in trouble. Thank you. Let's welcome John Diamond here today. Thank you for coming, John. Pennsylvania. Next up, Mr. Tom Hoefling from Iowa. Thank you, sir. Um, there's several things I want to get across here today. Uh, first of all, what's wrong with our country? Uh, you know, if you go to a doctor and you say, Doc, I'm sick, okay, and uh, what's wrong with me? He says, well, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I can fix you up. Um, 
Are you going to stick around and go to that doctor? So I, I want to talk today about what's wrong with the country and uh, offer up what I think are uh, the straightforward principles way, principled ways that we deal with that. Uh, in the first place, we need a spiritual revival in this country. And without God, we have nothing. Everything we have is from, from God. Uh, so my first goal in everything I do is to point the American people back to the reliance on God. It's the foundation for uh, everything we have in America. Uh, secondly, I, my main goal is to point Christians back to principle, back to truth, and try and convince them to stop compromising these core principles that are at the basis of our country. Because if, if the Christians would turn around in this country, 70% of the American people still self-identify as Christians. Okay, If even a third of those would quit compromising the way the Republicans have been compromising on life, on marriage, on judges, and all of this long list of things, this country would turn around practically overnight. So we need a spiritual revival, but we need a civic revival as well. Uh, so we've got to deal with the principled problem, but we also have a, a practical problem in terms of the way we do our politics. Uh, we now have a system that's run by the money and the media, not by we the people. And so we've got to turn back to principle. We've got to remake the way we do our politics. And I have a lot of ideas about how we can do that, that I've been trying out in the practical world for about 25 years. So I want to share those today. Thank Let's you. Let's welcome Tom Hofling today. Thank you for coming to Lansing, Michigan today, gentlemen. We will be videoing this debate. It will be up uh, on YouTube and other venues tonight. And so hopefully we'll enjoy a large audience that will get to meet you and hear what you have to say uh, today. Well, let's get started with questions, and uh, John, you're going to answer first. One of the most important legacies of any U.S. president is who he might appoint into the U.S. Supreme Court. What would be the qualities of your nominee, and what advice would you give to the current Senate regarding the current possible nominees, in particular Merrick Garland? If I had to point to one Supreme Court justice as, as a role model, I would point to one that never made it, and that would Robert Bork, Ronald Reagan's nomination, who the liberals just torpedoed. Um, if you've read his book, Slouching Towards Gomorrah, that was another one of those times in my life that really, I mean, that guy was brilliant. Um, it, it, he would have been a, an asset on the United States Supreme Court, somebody who understood the true nature of the Supreme Court, understood constitutional law, understand the, understood the foundations of it. Um, if you've actually read his book, Slouching Towards Gomorrah, he actually offers a solution. Um, uh, one of the one of the things that I was talking about in the back of the room, I was down at an awakening conference in Orlando two weeks ago. It was put on by Matt Stiver and the Liberty uh, Council down there. And I sat in, at, at dinner and was talking to a lot of the people that were speakers. I was actually the only one that wasn't a speaker there. Everybody else was a speaker at the event. And I said, and they were talking about the, the Oberfeld decision and, and, and all of this. And I said, let me ask you a question. I said, why is it that we do not push a constitutional amendment to make every federal judge an electable position? And they all looked at me like I just spoke Greek. <laughs> and one of them said, I've never thought of that. I said, in a democratic constitutional republic, how do we have people that hold so much power that are not accountable to the American people? And I said, one of the first things that I would love to do is just submit a constitutional amendment, making every person in government accountable to the people and, and to the votes of the people. Because right now, all you can do is impeach them, and nobody's ever going to do that. And they can sit up there like they're God and change God's laws, God's morality, change the Constitution, and there's nothing we can do about it. So we need, we need to take this country back, and we need to take the power back in our hands. Tom, speaking to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, who might your potential nominee be? Would it have to be a current sitting judge? And how can one ensure that a conservative appointee does not go liberal? Um, you don't have to be a lawyer to be appointed to the Supreme Court. So we could go further afield for sure. And I think perhaps we should. I could think of a few people that uh, might fit. Uh, as far as 
personal preferences, I would prefer somebody like a Judge Roy Moore uh, or a Herb Titus, uh, people who understand their oath and who will keep it and who understand the actual bounds of our courts. Um, Thomas Jefferson was already warning us back uh, 200 years ago about the dangers of an out-of-control judiciary. I spend a lot of my time fighting the idea of judicial supremacy. Uh, our legislators, whether it's Congress and our state legislatures, they're bound by this idea. So they craft legislation that is crafted to fit within the judicial supremacist line. Now, and we have to break that. And I hope you'll forgive my language, but we're never going to save this country until we learn to tell these judges to go to hell when they get outside of their appropriate jurisdiction, their appropriate authority. And we have to start electing legislators who have the guts to go in and impeach these people and remove them uh, when they uh, get outside their appropriate bounds. We tried to do this in my home state of Iowa. We had seven state Supreme Court justices who imposed so-called gay marriage on our state. We, the people, got rid of three of them in a judicial retention election. Uh, my state legislature later, with my help, crafted impeachment articles. Uh, the Republican leadership buried those impeachment articles in, in subcommittee. So we have to get leaders who will do their duty. Oh. Okay, Tom, this one is to you. The current U.S. debt stands at above $19 trillion. Is this a threat to national security? Can this, reverse, this trend be reversed, and how? Absolutely. It's a threat to national security. It's a threat to our entire existence economically. Um, how can it be reined in? It's very simple. We go back to spending within the enumerated powers of the Constitution of the United States. Uh, if we'll do that, a vast, uh, the vast majority of the things that the federal government is doing right now are outside the bounds of the enumerated powers. So we have to look at every program. We need to say, is it moral? If it's not moral, we need to throw it aside. If it's moral, we need to ask, is it constitutional? Mm -hmm. Okay, if it's uh, not constitutional, get rid of it. Uh, if it's constitutional, then we need to ask, is it necessary, absolutely necessary? Okay, if it's not necessary, get rid of it. If it is moral, constitutional, and necessary, then we need to implement it in the most efficient way that we can that encroaches the least on the liberties of the American people. Thank you. You bet. And, uh, John? Regarding the debt, how can the debt be ultimately eradicated? And what budgetary items would be maintained as deficit spending despite the debt? Um, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for empowering the people, and you'll hear me talking about constitutional amendments enough, because our founding fathers gave us, the people, the right to amend the Constitution, basically to restrain the government. That's why we're here. Um, one of the things that I've been for for a long time and will continue to be for is for a balanced budget amendment. Um, and, and if the federal government, the Republicans and the Democrats cannot be good stewards of the people's money, then, then the people need to force that upon them. You will balance that budget. Now, if elected president, I would have, any time a spending bill came across my debt before I even looked at it, does this expand the debt? If the answer is yet, take it back. Because if you can't work within the budgetary budgets that you've been given, um, one of the things that I really think helps sell us as a party against the Republicans and the Democrats is, is I give this illustration. I, I said when I was a when I was a baby, my my grandparents who were really poor uh, bought a savings bond for a hundred dollars, and and when I graduated, you know, I didn't have anything, but at least I wasn't in the red, and, and I had a hundred dollar savings bond, which I think was worth 125 at the time. I said, if you understand what these politicians are doing to your children, we are, what, $18 trillion in debt now. That's like them taking out a credit card in your child's name and putting $50,000 on it. And the second they're born saying, here's your debt, here's what you owe. We put our children in the red from day one, and who knows what it would be then. So we have to get the people to understand what these politicians are doing to us and to our children. We need to stop the spreading of the debt, and then we need to reverse it, and we need to start paying that back off. Thank you.
next picture. Mr. Diamond, the Middle East wars are rapidly expanding and seem to be setting off a new nuclear arms race. To what extent is the United States obligated to be there, and whose side should we be on? Who are our allies? Two ways you can look at that. One is a theologian, um, which is my primary call, is I will bless them that bless you, is what God says about Israel and about the Jewish people. Um, and I believe that we need to stand by them and, and defend them. Um, this wasn't part of the question, but um, Islam is not a religion. It is a political movement masquerading as a religion. If it's a religion, it's the worst religion on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, you, 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 claim to, you, you claim to not want people to go to hell. That's why you try to convert them. But as soon as they won't convert, you cut their heads off. You know, Christianity is just the opposite. We'll, we'll let you live as long as we possibly can because we want you to get to heaven. <laughs> if it's 50 years from now, I hope you find Christ. Um, so, I mean, standing with Israel, I believe, is something that we ought to do. If you understand end-time prophecy, if you understand the book of Revelation, it's going to hit the fan over there until Christ returns. Um, so we're not going to be able to change prophecy or what we know is already going to happen, but we can take a right position and we can take the right side, and, and that's what I'd be, I'd be for. Tom, what are our national interests in the Middle East, and what is now Russia's role? What are they up to, and what should our response be? If you're president, you'll have to deal with a Putin. That's a difficult question. It's one of the most difficult questions there is. Um, what are they up to? Um, mainly no good. <laughs> um, you know, I think we can work with Russia in many ways, um, but... You know, I think we need to go back to Reagan's dictum, which is trust but verify. Um, as far as Israel goes, um, they are our friend. They are our ally. They are an island of stability in the in the eastern end of the Mediterranean, so they're an important ally. Uh, Israel mainly wants to uh, take care of themselves. They don't want charity. I think we ought to get rid of all foreign aid constitutes charity in other words welfare if our constitution doesn't enumerate powers to uh, have welfare to our own people how can how in the world can it enumerate powers to have welfare for folks in other countries uh, I do believe in some foreign aid in terms of, of uh, our national defense because I, I have a son who's an officer in the uh, National Guard and I would rather expend some dollars than his blood I'll just be frank about it uh, but Israel really wants to defend themselves. Um, I think we can be a last gasp uh, friend of theirs, and I think we should be. Uh, but I think mainly they want us to quit arming their enemies. And so that's what I think we should do. All right. Thank you. Tom, we'll turn the page, and I want to ask you a question about Planned Parenthood. <clears throat> Planned Parenthood currently gets federal and in many places state funding for the services they provide. Should Planned Parenthood continue to get governor, uh, government funding? And how would you deal with the abortion industry as a whole? Stop it, further regulate it, or criminalize it? Planned Parenthood and those like them are mass murderers. Uh, the Republicans who are making funding for Planned Parenthood the only issue are they're hiding behind a big nothing. Uh, far uh, more important than who is funding it is that it is going on in the first place. Uh, I've made it very clear what I would do. Uh, first of all, I gotta say, I, I'm gonna brag a little bit. In November, Newsmax named me one of the top 100 most influential pro-life leaders in the country. I was shocked, but they did. Uh, American Right to Life, pro-life profiles, I'm the only candidate who is rated a tier one personhood pro-lifer. Uh, I've said for uh, years now, I said this when I ran four years ago, uh, the, the first thing I'll do in office is I'll take the oath because Article 6 requires that. Uh, but then I'll go sit down in the Oval Office and the first thing I will do is I will craft a presidential finding to the effect that the child in the womb is a person as per the 14th Amendment. 
the second thing I will do is I'll ask for the resignation of anybody in the executive branch who doesn't agree with that self-evident natural fact. And the third thing I'll do is I'll begin to shut down the abortion clinics using the power of the executive branch. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Feel free to clap, okay? And, John, in the same vein, is Roe v. Wade now the acceptable law of the land? How could, quote-unquote, women's productive rights be satisfied if abortion were outlawed or defunded? Um, before this whole started, me and my brother stood back here and just talked about some of these things. And, and one of the things that I said is, I don't want to debate him. I want to debate <laughs> the other parties because we all agree on pretty much everything that's being, being said here. Um, one of the things that we agree on is the, the myth of ju uh, judicial superiority and that somehow that, that our country thinks that, that we have a supreme tribunal that gets to decide everything. If you read the Federalist Papers, um, well, before that, Thomas Jeff Jefferson said to consider the Supreme Court the highest arbitrator on all constitutional matters is create a very dangerous doctrine indeed. And then he turns around and said the, the Constitution erected no such single tribunal. That's a lie that we've bought into. That's a lie that all the Republicans and Democrats have bought into. If you go back and you study what the judiciary was created as, you have to go back to Federalist Papers and Federalist 78 said we will now consider the federal judiciary, who is by far the weakest of the three departments. They hold not the sword, nor they hold the purse, and they rely on the executive for the enforcement. That's what we need. We need a president that understands that um, Abraham Lincoln did it, I think Truman did it, and FDR did it. You've made your ruling, now enforce it. I am the enforcement branch of this government, and I disagree with Roe v. Wade. It is an absolute abomination. It is genocide. It is unconstitutional. You had no right to go into the states and, and shoot down these laws. And since I am, the, I am the enforcement, I am not enforcing it. And I would tell every state and every state representative, you, you, you criminalize abortion in your state, and I will make sure the federal government stakes off your back. Excellent. Good. Tom Heffling has a rebuttal. Thirty seconds. Uh, I don't really want to rebut you, brother. That's I just right. I Go wanted ahead. the thirty seconds to add to what yeah. you're saying. Go ahead. Great. Amen. Great. Uh, Great. Look, I'll make a political point. These two points: personhood of the child, their protect, protection by the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments, the myth of judicial supremacy. This is the core of what we should be fighting for. And, and, and I'll tell you, folks, if you want to pull the church into the Constitution Party. You focus on those things. And I'll tell you, you get to know me, you're going to find out that's where my heart is. Mm -hmm. And that's where the activists that I will bring to the party will come from, is from the abolitionist movement, from the personhood movement, from the true pro-life movement. Absolutely. Amen. Excellent, excellent, excellent. <laughs> Not exactly rebuttals, but great information and education. Okay. I think we're going to go to John this time. John, we're going to talk about the Federal Reserve, okay? The Federal Reserve is under constant pressure to control inflation, limit interest rates, and even, to some extent, manage banking policy. How would you deal with this institution as the President of the United States, and what did the Constitution intend regarding practical fiscal policy? Well, the Federal Reserve needs to be abolished. Um, I think it was... I think it was sorry. Go ahead. I think it was... Um, 1913 is when that Federal Reserve Act was passed, um, which basically took what we, the people's right to regulate their own currency and turn it over to a bunch of private bankers. And I think most of us understand that. Um, um, Ron Paul was real big behind that and trying to end that, the IRS, the Federal Reserve. Um, everything in this country has to be under the control of the American people. And when you, when you place one of the most important things other than the spirituality of a nation, it's money. And like, like the brother said, money controls everything. You control money, you control everything. Um, and, and spirituality is really the only thing that can overpower that lust for power and since it is the root of all evil. Um, but first and foremost, the Federal Reserve just needs to go away. And, and we need to educate. First thing we need to do is to educate the American people uh, about that. There's a lot of good videos out there about the Federal Reserve and how they came to be. Um, we need to be promoting that in every school, in every town meeting. I mean, these videos 
you know, need to be need to be shown so they know the true evil nature behind the Federal Reserve Act and how that whole thing came to be. Excellent. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Tom, uh, should the government bail out banks and lending institutions? Is the current relationship between the Fed, the Federal Reserve, and the Treasury Department legitimate? Uh, the answer to your first question is no, the federal government shouldn't be being bailing out private entities. Uh, the relationship, the creation of the Fed, they, what, I call it a monstrosity, okay? It's neither man nor beast. It's not governmental and it's not private. It's somewhere in between, kind of like our post office. You know, the post office is a constitutional uh, responsibility of our government. What did they do? They passed off the responsibility. They created this entity. Uh, that is neither man nor beast. Uh, in our little town, they tried to close our post office. And uh, uh, we couldn't get any of our politicians to do anything about it. They say we can't do anything about it, right? But they're now also not controlled by the free market, and they're getting our tax dollars. So we need to put the post office back in governmental hands. Mm -hmm. That's where it belongs. But uh, the same goes with the Fed. The Fed is the Congress shirking one of its primary responsibilities. And we need to start getting some congressmen who will quit passing the buck to some other entity that they've created that just allows them to basically do nothing or do bad things behind a cover uh, that's been provided for them. So kill the Fed, uh, get some congressmen who actually understand monetary policy, and uh, uh, let's get back to governing ourselves, like you said. Okay. Rebuttal? Okay, good. Thank you. John, go ahead. Again, there's not going to be much rebuttal here, just agreement. <laughs> um, but it's just common sense. Why would, you, why would you outsource the managing of a nation's money and then pay interest to that organization mm -hmm. when you can do it interest-free? Mm -hmm. If I can give you a credit card and you, and you can have it interest-free, why would you take a credit card that you have to pay interest on? You know, why did we create this monstrosity that, that we're paying interest to when the, when the Congress has the right to regulate all of this itself? So I agree completely with my brother here. Thank you, John. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's talk federal mandates. Federal mandates continue to encroach upon both states' rights and individual rights. Out west, we've got federal mandates with, you know, land grabs. Uh, this is to Tom. What federal agencies need to be curbed or eliminated altogether, and what could you do to reverse Obamacare, Obamacore, and other mandates? That's a lot easier to list the ones that we should keep. Um, uh, even in some of our states, for example, go to California and look at their list of, of state agencies. And you go to their web page and you start scrolling and you scroll and you scroll and you scroll and you scroll. It's a long, long list. The federal government is infinitely bigger than that. So, you know, we need to cut out everything. Again, that test, everything that's immoral, everything that's not constitutional and everything that isn't absolutely necessary. And let's just go in there and, and cut them all out. Uh, let the states do their job. Uh, I want to make one quick mm -hmm. comment about the states. Mm -hmm. The states also need to be held to their st our state constitutions. You know, you read the Tenth Amendment, it talks about the legitimate powers of the federal government and the states and the people, respectively. We need to start reigning in our states as well. We need to get the federal government out of education, for example. They have no enumerated power in that regard. But we need to get our states out of the, out of education as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to be working on that. Over 60% of our state budgets are going into this education hole, which is being used to indoctrinate our children into a communist, uh, godless ideology. Let's stop that. I, I have a plan that I've advocated for more than 20 years. I call it TLC, true local control of our schools. It's not take our dollar, send it to the state capitol or to uh, Washington, let them run it through a big bureaucracy and send a little bit uh, back with strings attached. Let's restore true local control of the parents. I'm a homeschool dad. I got into politics 25 years ago because of that. You know, I mean, we need to go er through every program and agency and cut, 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 just as hard as we can, as fast as we can, uh, before we bankrupt our great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
John, how can the presidency reverse federal trends in land acquisitions and armed agencies? Also, would you counsel states to refuse federal money or put less mandates to federal money handouts? As I said in my last my last answer, the presidency is the is, is the enforcement branch of the federal government. If the president chooses not to enforce something, it doesn't get enforced. All those agencies are under his control. And if he just says, leave the people out there alone, leave the rangers alone, you know, let them graze on the land, you know, but this is just, again, this is just a tyrannical government that is just trying to take over everything from everybody. Um, if you've read my first book and I have copies of it in, in, in the back there, um, one of the, the biggest things that I stress is the 10th Amendment. 98% of what the federal government does today is illegal. It's unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. They have no authority. Mm -hmm. and, and when we talked about judicial supremacy, I've written a paper on this. What they did was they used the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was, was 13, 14, and 15th Amendment were created after the Civil War to free the slaves and make sure they were getting their rights in the South. That was it. Three court cases throughout history, it was like 1872 Slaughterhouse case, I think 1890 and 19. 13, the Supreme Court heard three challenges about the 14th Amendment, and people were trying to say the 14th Amendment expanded federal power. And three times the Supreme Court said, no, it didn't. But it was until FDR got in there and had 18 terms at president, and he basically outlived everybody and put all his cronies on the Supreme Court. It, that last case where the Supreme Court heard it, they said, this is no longer open for debate until FDR got his people in there, and then they ruled... No, the 14th Amendment does give the federal government far sweeping power over the states. No, it does not. And that's the first thing that I do as president is make that very, very clear. If, 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 it, if it's not an enumerated power in that constitution or prohibited to the states, federal government will keep its nose out of the states and out of the people's rights. Excellent. Good. Go ahead. Yeah. Tom? Again, I'm not going to rebut, um, but I just want to I, some things just need a fuller discussion. And, yeah. and uh, look, I, I've advocated heavily that the chief executive should resist. We're supposed to have checks and balances, okay? So, you know, I'm willing to take on the Congress and the courts right. in order to fulfill my own oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. However, the other side of that is the president is, is to ex execute all constitutional uh, constitutionally ratified laws. So you've always got to be examining this and you got to make sure that you don't get outside your, your appropriate powers. Uh, the Clint Eastwood rule, I call it. Uh, a man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> Thank you. All right, to, to uh, Mr. Diamond. Can I get one? Go ahead. One go ahead. 30 seconds. I, I just like to go back to, to slavery. Um, Abraham Lincoln, Secretary of State, said that there's a, high, a law higher than the Constitution, and that's what we've lost in this country. There is a law higher than the Constitution, and if the, if the Supreme Court rules something and the Congress rules something, I don't care if they call it a law. If it's not a law, it's not a law. Mm -hmm. when, they, when they legalized slavery and the Fugitive Slave Act, what did the Christians do? I ain't returning no slave. You can pass a fugitive. It's called civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. You can, you, can, you, you can make all the laws you want, but if God says that you will not return a slave to his master, guess who I'm going to listen to? I must obey God rather than man. Right. right. <laughs> Mr. Diamond, to you, post-World War II institutions like NATO and the United Nations still dominate U.S. foreign policy. How will you curb growing U.N. power and anti-U.S. policy and... Is NATO even still relevant? Is it viable? And also, because it's in the news today, should Turkey be a part of it? Turkey is becoming more and more Islamic. It used to be a very moderate state. It was almost secular Islam, so to speak. Um, the, the, the Muslims have basically just taken that over, and it's now just become radical, just, just like anybody else. To put the American people and to put America into a situation where we're just like, one vote in many just challenges our sovereignty mm -hmm. as a nation. Um, the, we should be out of the United Nations 
you know, George Washington, I think he said friendship with all, but allegiance to none. Mm-hmm. Um, we should, we should be friends with all. We should help anybody that wants our help and wants our aid, but we are not going to let any other country. We are not going to let no governing body on a world level make one law and make one treaty. You cannot own firearms, none of this stuff. You know, nobody should control America and America policy except the American people. And the United Nations, again, it's almost like world socialism. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, first first states' rights had to disappear, all right? Every state was sovereign, and they did their own thing, and then they federalized that. Well, now they're just trying to take that basket and put it in another basket, which is the United Nations. And they're trying to put it under that control of that one world type government. And, and the only way tyranny is ever dissolved is to put power in so many hands as possible that if you get control of this one, you control everything. But if you got sovereignty broke up among all the states and everything else, it is so hard to get control of every state and every legislator. So but power needs to be spread out, and getting out of the U.N. is, is a good start. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Tom, how can the State Department be renovated, reinvented, revived, and are you more globalist or more isolationist? That's a great question. Um, I don't know about the State Department. We might need to burn it all to the ground and salt the earth. I'm not sure, but no. Obviously, obviously, the State Department is a you know legitimate constitutional function of our government. Uh, you know, we need to clean house. Obviously, as far as being a globalist or an isolationist, I'm neither. Uh, I'm certainly not a globalist. I believe that the President of the United States is being elected to secure the lives, the liberty, the property of the American people, to protect our sovereignty, our security, our borders. Uh, we do have treaties, uh, and the president, of course, is bound by those constitutionally. So if there are bad treaties, and there's plenty of them, we need to work to, through the constitutional process to get out of them as soon as possible. In the meantime, we have to honor our treaties. We have to do that, and the president of the United States has to do that. Um, I've always looked at this question as a road. On the one hand, you have the transnationalist globalists who who care only about their own power and their own money. They don't care about the people of the United States or our sovereignty or our security. Uh, Those people have been in control my whole life and beyond, and they need to be driven out. Uh, However, you can't be a total isolationist. It would be, I would put it on a personal level, if you lived in a town and there was a mob on the other side of town robbing and raping and pillaging and killing people you could you know lock up your doors and board up your windows and say i have nothing to do with it okay but first of all would that be moral to do that Mm -hmm. and secondly you know the old question of cain you know am i my brother's keeper does come into play we have to have a moral basis in the world uh but uh the second part is the mob's going to come knocking on your door pretty quick after they have burned down the rest of the town. So we do, we do have a role in the world. We just need to pull way back from what the globalists have wrought over these many years. I agree. Uh, we need to get out of the UN. We need another organization of freedom loving countries that respect life, liberty, property, and our God given rights. But in order to do that, we've got to start by cleaning up our own house and becoming a, a shining city on a hill ourselves again so we can set an example to the world. John, we'll go back to you. Uh, talking about U.S. borders, uh, right now, uh, borders are under great scrutiny and pressure in the media and by the world. They're criticizing us. Do we have a border problem? What is it? And how do you strengthen the borders? I'm working on a book called America Blessed or Cursed. Um, If you go to my website, peacemakersoutreach.com, and go to videos, I did a 30-minute video um, on what it takes for a nation to be blessed or cursed, and it's based on Deuteronomy 28, that if you keep my laws and you keep my commandments, you'll be blessed in all these areas. And then God says, if you violate my laws and don't keep my commandments, you'll be cursed in all these areas. And there's like twice as many curses as there are blessings. 
it, it, I, I was trying to, to reach a gentleman one time about what, what it is we're trying to do. And he says, I don't have time to deal with this. I'm dealing with this illegal uh, immigration problem. And I said, do you realize that you're just dealing with the symptom rather than the root? Do you realize that one of the curses that would be pronounced upon a nation that strayed from God and his words was that you would be invaded by aliens and they would eat the substance of your fields? Mm. I mean, that's exactly what's happening. I mean, Mexico's been poor and existed down there for 300 years and they didn't invade us. And now all of a sudden, it's just since 1960, since we kicked God and prayer out, now all of a sudden we've got this flood. I mean, don't we understand the root of the problem mm -hmm. is that's just part of the curse? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and you can go straight through that and deal with most of America's problems. And they're just sy symptomatic of the curse that's upon this nation for betraying God and turning, kicking out his word, kicking him out of schools, kicking him out of prayer. Um, so we, we do got a problem. Um, you can you can deal with that on any number of le levels from a legislative standpoint, but I'm all about killing the root. <laughs> you know, I can go out and pull dandelions out of my yard all day long, but two days later, they're going to come back. You kill the root and it never comes back. Mm -hmm. Okay, the root of most of what we're dealing with in this country is, is we're under a curse because we we've, we've disobeyed God and His commandments. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Tom, what is good immigration policy? How is it executed? Is there any aspect to an amnesty that we should consider? Uh, your last question. No. Uh, if a house guest comes to your house, you've invited them. And they move in their your house, or they they come and visit you. They're in your house on the basis of their mere presence there. Can they claim membership in your family? How about a burglar? Uh, so no. Uh, if they're foreign nationals and they're here illegally, they need to be sent home. Period. Um, look, government is about borders. Okay, it's knowing where the appropriate borders are in terms of rights, in terms of God's prerogatives, in terms of constitutional prerogatives. But our physical borders, if we don't have those, we don't have a country anymore. We do not have the rule of law. We do not have national sovereignty any longer. So Article 4, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution guarantees to the states a Republican form of government and uh, that the, the, the federal government, the national general government, will protect the states from invasion. So we have a gross dereliction of one of the primary duties, and, and the Democrats and the Republicans are both responsible for this. And they need, we need to hang that around their neck. Uh, they're destroying our country demographically, economically, in terms of crime, in terms of our elections are even threatened now. Uh, national security. I, again, the first day in office after I uh, took care of the abortion question, I would I would sign another presidential finding that our open southern border, which I've been in all four states many times down the border with the men and men. Uh, uh, I would have a presidential finding that says that that open border is a clear and present danger to the security of the United States, and I would deploy our military to secure that border immediately. Okay, to you, Tom. Everybody wants, nobody wants taxes, but they're there. Everybody wants fair taxation and a fair collection policy. What constitutes fair tax and collection? Can the IRS be fixed? How? No, the IRS can't be fixed. Uh, talk about burning down and salting the ground. That one for sure. Uh, for for 25 years, <clears throat> I've been a fundamental tax reformer for 25 years. I've been involved in this fight. I was for a fair tax before there was a fair tax, uh, long before that, and helped bring that to the forefront across this country 20-some years ago, along with my Congress, who is now my congressman, Steve King, and other people. And uh, I don't think the fair tax is quite good enough, though. Uh, I think we can do better than that. It has some aspects. It has a prebate function. They put it in as a political measure to try and make it uh, progressive. And I think it's a bad idea to have uh, the government sending every family a check every month. I don't like that. We can do much simpler. We can replace the entire IRS with one clerk in the Treasury Department with a, a terminal. And we, uh, we do that by simply letting the states collect the sales tax, 
Okay, the 46 states already have the mechanism in place for it's mostly just a little computer programming to change over to this system. Most of the sales taxes are collected by big companies like Walmart and other companies. They just simply have to reprogram their computers. We would we would put our producers back in the driver's seat in the, in the world market. We would begin to tax foreign producers in our market, which is still the largest in the world, mm -hmm. barely, but it is. Um, it would also clean up politics. It's a it's a uh, mechanism for dividing and conquering us, this tax system that we have now. And it would shut down that game. I call it the largest protection racket in the history of mankind. So there's all kinds of aspects, a long list of aspects that junking the income tax, uh, direct taxation is wicked. Property taxes at the state level, we should get rid of property taxes too. If, if you have to pay that property tax, you don't really own your property. So I, I think we should go to entirely indirect taxations as simple and non-invasive as we can possibly devise. All right. John, should, uh, should revenues be permanently fixed to spending? And speaking, he kind of referenced the tariff policy. Does tariff policy need to be reworked? Does it need to be fixed? And how do we do that? Yeah, I like his answer on the tariff policy. I mean, I think um, I think he said it all. I, don't, I wouldn't really add a whole lot to that. Um, trying to fix the economy in a minute and 30 second sound bite is probably not something that, mm -hmm. that, that I'm going to be able to articulate the best, but I wanted, I wanted to share the most important thing that I think we need to do in this matter. And that's end all these free, uh, free trade agreements. Um, I, I was one of the things that I think that we can basically take down both the Democrats and the Republicans on is the fact that both parties have sent all our jobs overseas. I was a union steward when I was a lineman for the electric company. Um, they pushed Bill Clinton and pushed Bill Clinton. Um, all the unions were against these fair trade agreements. They pushed it through anyway. And I was just waiting to see the next election that they would just come down on Clinton. And then they started calling me and emailing me saying, as a union man, you need to vote for Clinton. And I wrote this scathing email to every labor union I could think of. And I said, "How? if you want to support another Democrat just because of your political ideology, that's fine. I said, but why are you supporting a guy that just knifed unions in the back? They sent all the American jobs overseas, and, and they say they care about the wages of the working man. That's what your primary, single most, uh, you know, fundamental idea is. And now they just sent all our jobs overseas, and, uh, and now here you are wanting me to vote for this guy. Well, it's no matter because then Bush turned around and signed a gap. So both Democrats and Republicans, A, are responsible for putting this country in debt, and then two – the chance to pay that debt off is going away because now all our jobs are leaving and all that income we could be bring, bringing in to pay off the debt. It's almost like if you were intentionally trying to destroy the country, <laughs> send all your jobs overseas and then just you know raise the debt to a place you can't even pay it off. Yeah, thank you, John. Tom, go ahead, 30 seconds. Yeah, a couple of quick things. I want to say one thing, first of all, about the debt. This debt that we're running up is immoral, okay? Absolutely. And it's robbing our posterity of their God-given unalienable right to government by consent. Hmm. Our great-grandchildren have not agreed to be saddled with this debt. So it's immoral. It violates uh, our national charter, the Declaration of Independence, uh, the natural law principles stated there. Uh, as far as jobs going overseas, the primary reason there is because we're stupid. <laughs> I'll just be blunt about it. We're stupid. We are penalizing businesses. Businesses ultimately don't pay taxes. They pass those costs of compliance and the taxes themselves along to the consumers. Okay. Let's unburden business. If we do that, this will be the most attractive place on the entire planet to do business. Let's quit burdening uh, capital and uh, the things that form capital. Let's take all the burden off of that and quit being Dumb. Yeah, thank you. John, go ahead. <laughs> hey, I just want to jump on board with that and go back to the whole NAFTA question. I remember Clinton standing up talking about, you know, the reason that these all these illegal aliens are coming over because they just want jobs. And if we send some of our jobs to Mexico, they'll quit coming over. Well, how'd that turn out? Mm -hmm. it, it, it didn't. I mean, it's gotten worse and it's gotten worse. 
when I was in the United States Air Force, I was a security police. I had a secret clearance. I guarded nuclear weapons. And one of the things that we, you absolutely did not do as far as national defense and national security is you did not send jobs to communist countries. And that's exactly what we did. We could not keep them from going to Mexico, but guess what? They left there and they went to China. And now all our money is going to a communist country whose ideology is totally opposite of ours. That is the worst national defense, national policy move you could have ever possibly made. Thank you. All right, last question in the formal portion of our debate, and you will get a closing comment as well, so you don't have to do that right now. But um, our national moral condition is a future indicator of our national health and identity. We've talked about that. And so, John, what can the presidency do to address the crumbling moral foundations? Contrary to what the president has said, are we a Christian nation? When you say, are we a Christian nation, open up your phone book and look at houses of worship. Christian churches out and everything, 200 to 1. So, I mean, what are you going to say? We got one Buddhist in the country, so we're no longer a Christian nation. We're now a Buddhist nation, a Muslim. That's what Obama said. We're now this, we're now... No, primarily we are a Christian nation. We were founded on Christian principles. America was started because because God understood that all these persecuted Christians in Europe were going to need a place to flee. Read Thomas Paine's Common Sense. He said, he, said the, the, he said America was discovered the same time as the Protestant Reformation as if God knew his persecuted people would need a place to flee in the coming future. So yes, we, <laughs> these were religious refugees fleeing persecution in, in, in the old land. Um, so yes, we are and we were and we've always been a Christian nation. There's been mass um, um, money poured into erasing our history. That's why I wrote that book. Um, is to re-educate the, the American people on that. One of the things that I would do, again, is the executive branch is as the enforcer, all those rules on separation of church and state that the Supreme Court passed in 61, 62, and 63, the First Amendment Constitution says this, Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. The federal government has no authority, no constitutional authority to go into the states and tell the American people when and where and how and who they can pray to. And, and that's exactly what I'd do. I would sign an executive order immediately saying the American people are free to pray as much as they want or as little as they want. The federal government will get their hands off people's Bibles, people's prayers, and people's faiths. Amen. Tom, today because of the Sharia question, because of LGBT marriage, so to speak, uh, those things don't seem to hold the same space as religious liberty, and so we have a conflict. What constitutes religious liberty? Should Muslim Sharia be allowed? Does homosexual LGBT marriage, uh, the, the so-called right, does it alter society and can it be reversed? Oh, it's altering society radically. Uh, our children are being infected with it, and the country is basically going away. Uh, look, religious liberty is the the right given from God to do what's right and to worship him, okay? Uh, there is no right to do wrong, okay? So Islam is incompatible with our American form of government in every way. You can't be uh, loyal to the Quran and loyal to the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence. It's just not possible. So I think it's a threat to our country, actually. As far as the homosexuals, uh, uh, again, no right to do wrong. They're claiming rights that cannot be rights. What is the word? It's right. We have to get back to our basic Christian historical understanding of the basic difference between right and, law and wrong. Uh, the natural moral law, even little children understand it. They know it's wrong to kill babies. Uh, they know that a child is supposed to have a mommy and a daddy, not a mommy and a mommy, or a daddy and a daddy. And so, look, morality is the key component. It's the underpinning of our entire form of self-government, our uh, entire Republican constitutional form of government, and our very claim to liberty in this country. Uh, Thomas Jefferson famously, he was looking ahead, he was looking at the slavery question, he said, I tremble 
when I consider that God is just. You want to know that the number one most important national security threat we have is continuing to stick our finger and poke God in the mm -hmm. eye. Excellent. Thank you. That's great. You want to rebut? Go ahead. I'll no? just use my last you one. You got one left. We're, we're at the Good. end. Um, religious freedom is the foundation of this nation. What we have to do as a party, if we are going to bring everybody, the entire religious right out of the Republican Party, is we are going to have to not make them promises but uphold them because mm -hmm. they are our promises. Mm -hmm. they, they are what we believe in. The three foundational things that I said that I would do, um, the second I got inaugurated, I would walk right back to that Oval Office and A, I would end the Johnson Amendment. You will not, you will no longer tell churches they have to, what they can and cannot say. Um, and, and the biggest one is I would restore re religious freedom. You want to teach the Bible in schools, that's a state's rights thing. That should be debated in every classroom and every school board meeting in every state. The federal government needs to stay out of that. And then the next thing that I would do is I, per I would protect Christians from the persecution that's happening now by the LBGT community where they're finding bakers. And, and I would no. Religious freedom is a God-given right. It's constitutionally protected, and the Civil Rights Act of 1960 says that no person will be discriminated based on religion. I would tell any these ACLU and the people for the American way, if you go after one Christian and you try to suppress their freedom of religion, I will bring the weight of the Justice Department down on your head. You leave them alone. <laughs> Tom, you have one rebut left. Do you want to finish 30 I, seconds? I do. Go, go ahead. <laughs> See, if we get rid of the federal income tax, we get rid of the IRS, the whole 501c scheme disappears. That's right. I abandoned that model myself years ago. I used to be involved in many foundations and PACs and all these things. Uh, I, I finally came to realize that whole setup is actually a government establishment of religion. Mm -hmm. That is the federal government saying, Muslim mosque, you're a recognized religion in the United States. So... There's lots of benefits, again, to getting rid of the income tax. And one of the big ones is it's uh, 501c and uh, they're trying to control churches. It's all irrelevant because it's just gone. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> that ends the uh, formal portion of our debate. Thank you, gentlemen, for those good answers. We appreciate that. We want to give you time to uh, have closing statements. And uh, so, gentlemen, we're going to go with um, the two minutes plus a minute and a half, okay, on the closing statement. So once the two minute rolls around, we'll hit the, can you go to three and a half there? Okay, excellent. Look at that. that high tech, low tech, but we're there. And uh, these guys aren't going to follow that anyway, so that's okay. Um, but uh, gentlemen, uh, we'll, we'll, John, we'll start with you because you drew straws, and then Tom, you get the, the last word today in this. But I think it's important uh, for people listening that you also – say how we can get a hold of you, how we can contact you, if you have a website or anything like that. So make sure that you include that in your closing statements today. And uh, first of all, we'll have John Diamond with closing statements. Well, let me just address that first. Um, um, you can contact me at peacemakersoutreach.com um, and then just email email me from there and I'll, I'll get back with you. Let me get that out of the way first and foremost. Um, when, when I decided to to throw my hat in the ring, so to speak, what I did was I began shopping my message around to a lot of people I work with. I, and, and I work with people that are Christian and non-Christian, people that are Republican and Democrat, people that go to church, don't go to church, vote, don't vote. And when I started asking around, you know, would you support me? And they were like, well, what are you running on? And I said, I'm running on Americanism. And they're like, well, what do you mean Americanism? And I said, well, what's it mean to be an American? What do Americans believe? And you'd be surprised that people are just like, uh, uh, I said, if a foreigner come up on the street and said, hey, you're American, what do you believe? What is your number one belief? And they couldn't answer that question. So I said, you have to go back to the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence is not, was not a declaration of war. It was a statement of faith. It's like, look, we're all Americans, and this is what we believe. You don't believe the same thing, so here's our divorce papers. Okay, and here's what we believe. We believe in a creator. We believe that we've been endowed by that creator with certain inalienable rights. That means they can't be taken away by any human power. Judges, presidents, congressmen, my right to pray comes from God. I don't need the Supreme Court's permission to pray. I'll pray when I want, how I want, to who I want, and there ain't a person on this planet going to tell me I can't. Now, you can persecute me. 
You can throw me in jail. You can do like they did to Daniel, but you're not taking my right away, and I'm not surrendering that just based on your intimidation. Yeah, excellent. So, so I said, that's the first thing that you have to understand. I said, I got four little boys. If I give them a bicycle, it's inalienable. There ain't nobody else can take that away. <laughs> if you do, you're stealing. And, and, and if our Heavenly Father gives us a series of rights, whether it's the right to bear arms, whether it's the freedom of religion, whether it's the freedom of speech, if God, our Creator, has given us these rights, then nobody can take them away. And our Founding Fathers understood that, so they created a constitution which was a legal document around those rights and it says congress you shall not take away their freedom of speech you shall not take away their freedom of religion you shall not take away their firearms the government the constitution was created as a federal government restraining order to keep the government out of the rights of the people the god-given rights of the people and it says government was created to secure those rights, and that whenever a government fails to secure those rights, it's the right and the duty of the people to throw off that government and put new mm -hmm. guards of our liberty in place. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. We need a revolution. Mm -hmm. Now, that revolution is going to take place one of two ways. Yeah. It's going to take place by the bullet box or the, or the ballot box. Mm -hmm. And as a Christian, I'm doing everything I can to keep Americans from killing Americans, <laughs> especially if the government starts sending military veterans in and it turns into something like that. The, the Christian church, the American people, the gun rights owners, the gun lovers, anybody that loves their God-given constitutionally protected rights needs to wake up. They need to get out and vote, and they need to vote for somebody who understands what the Constitution is there for. It's a federal government restraining order mm. to keep the government out of the states and out of the states' rights. And as president, that is the first thing that I would stand up and say. They would say, well, all these executive orders you're passing is, is, is tyranny. No, tyranny is when a dictator imposes stuff on people. I'm here to set my people free. Mm. I'm here yeah. to get the government off your back, mm. not to impose more stuff on you. And, and that, that's what I'm all about. You know, Moses, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King. <laughs> All said the same thing. Let my people go. Mm -hmm. Get government off my back. And that's exactly what the next le generation of leader needs to do. Let's thank John Diamond for being here today. John Diamond from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. Thank you. Tom Heflin, closing your line. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think we kind of fulfilled my goals that I set out at the beginning. I wanted to talk about principles about turning the country back to God, and I think that was covered pretty well. I want to thank John. Um, you know, so I want to kind of close with some of the practical things as far as building the party um, and why I think you should nominate me. I hope that I can win your support based on, on my merits of 25 years of pretty intense activism. Uh, and and the, the strength of the principles that I stand for without compromising. Uh, however, I do bring some practical uh, help to the party if you nominate me. Uh, we do have act activists in all the states, not huge numbers, but they're very high quality people. They're solid Christian people. Um, I'm very likely to win the American Party nomination in May in Kansas City. Uh, again, small group, not much ballot access, but they've been around 40 some years. It's, you know, solid people. They're very, they're like us. Uh, the American Independent Party, I expect to win that nomination again uh, in July, as I did uh, in 2012. Uh, the California ballot's a pretty big deal. It's the biggest electoral prize of all. Uh, America's Party, which I founded eight years ago, uh, has people all over the country, and I do expect to garner that nomination as well. Again, not a lot of ballot access, just just good activists. And a, a lot of people who have had to work to get on ballots over many years, uh, whether it was in the Republican Party or post-Republican Party. Um, so, you know, we know the practical aspects of politics and what's required. you got to have people who will show up, and you got to have people who will work. It's always difficult to find those people. So, but we're doing the work of doing that. We want to bring all of our efforts in behind the Constitution Party and put the Constitution Party first. Your ballot access interests, your party building interests, we want to put first. 
And so we're not going to be trying to get any more state ballots. If I get the nomination, our people are, have already made the commitment uh, to come in and support the Constitution Party and join up. So that's what we want to do. Um, I hope you'll really give me consideration. TomHofling.com, T-O-M-H-O-E-F-L-I-N-G.com is my website. Uh, TomHofling at gmail.com is my Gmail. Uh, I, I'm very responsive to inquiries. Send me a phone number. I'll call you. Uh, otherwise, for eight and a half years, we've had our America Summit Restore the Republic calls, uh, national town hall meetings every Tuesday and Thursday night. Uh, send me an email. I'll make sure you get the information if you would like to participate in those. They're wide open town hall meetings, people from all over the country. Uh, they're very informative, very deep conversations that we we have twice a week. So I'd love to have you join me. I moderate those calls so you, you have direct access to me, all you can stand. Uh, so any questions that you have, I'm going to stick around today. I know we're going to have a question and answer time, but I'm going to stick around as long as necessary today to answer any of your questions as well. Thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Let's thank Tom Hopling from Iowa. <laughs>